intended for some of this morning, and this is yet another area to throw into the mix and, and alter outcome in this patient group. So I don't have a conflict of interest, um, and some of that's related to the fact that um, I'm involved in the NICE guidelines for obstructive sleep apnea, hypopnea syndrome that are in development at the moment and will be published around uh, September time next year. So what I hope to cover um, in this presentation is I will deal with some of the evolving and new views on phenotypes of obstructive sleep apnea, particular clinical presentations, then the interrelationships between obstructive sleep apnea and obesity, diabetes, and uh, cardiovascular disease. Um, so the underpinning information on the underlying pathophysiology so we can see how these things do interact. And then I will talk about this bi-directional relationship of new incident uh, obstructive sleep apnea in patients with type 2 diabetes and in the other direction, uh, type 2 diabetes, new instant type 2 diabetes occurring in obstructive sleep apnea. Though, of course, many of the patients already have type 2 diabetes before they're diagnosed. I'll speak about treatment of obstructive sleep apnea, particularly with CPAP therapy, and whether that does influence the progression of the diabetes. Uh, also, uh, briefly, obstructive sleep apnea, it is more prevalent in type 1 diabetes, and then I'll dwell uh, for some, a little bit of time on uh, gender differences because there are different presentations in males and females and end with some real world uh, considerations on who to suspect, uh, who to refer, uh, how they're diagnosed and their management and outcomes. So the most recent prevalence estimates are, we're talking big figures again as you've been talking about all, all morning. Um, an apnea hypopnea index of between 5 and 15 per hour is considered as mild, so mild obstructive sleep apnea in just under a quarter of the, the population. This is in a group aged between 30 and uh, 69, so sort of uh, that sort of age range, and moderate or severe obstructive sleep apnea, and that's an apnea hypopnea index of greater than 15 in about 5% of the population. As a rule of thumb, across the board, it's about half the prevalence in females and males up to the menopause, but after the menopause, the prevalence of obstructive sleep apnea is the same in females and males. Now, this, um, this everyone knows uh, Joe the fat boy in Dickens. In fact, he probably has obesity hyperventilation syndrome, not obstructive sleep apnea, but I think this, the, the common stereotype when we think about a patient with obstructive sleep apnea is we tend to think of an obese middle-aged male who's sleepy and indeed people do present that way but um, this big prospective cohort which is a European cohort including those from the UK <coughs> a decent number of females in included has actually shown which is coming something that is coming out from other studies in that this um, presentation of the excessively sleepy patient is not the sole presentation and that you see groups of patients at least as many presenting with excessive daytime somnolence, CDS, and insomnia, so they don't sleep well at night but they're sleepy during the day. Then a mixture of other non-sleepy, non-insomnia but they've got symptoms of sleep fragmentation, they may be tired or fatigued during the day, or a presentation of obstructive sleep apnea, contrary to what people used to think, with insomnia, just and usually a sort of sleep maintenance type of, of insomnia. So uh, it means we have to think more broadly when we're uh, diagnosing patients or at least having a different sort of level of suspicion, more about general sleep-related symptoms and daytime symptoms. Perhaps not surprisingly, the type of phenotype that's most likely to respond to CPAP therapy is the more sleepy patient. Now, as well as different kinds of clinical phenotypes and presentations, um, it's also becoming evident that there is not one homogenous underlying mechanism of why, and I'm talking predominantly about obstructive sleep apnea, not central sleep apnea, why the airway flops shut at night. Now, the, the ways you can differentiate between the, the subtypes are quite difficult. They have to be done in so detailed physiological experiments at night, so they're not easy to be able to break down the underlying mechanisms in the person in front of you. But essentially, when you do these physiological experiments, 
There are some patients who uh, have an airway which is very likely to close, so it's near critical closing pressure, and as soon as that person goes to sleep, we lose upper airway muscle tone as we go to sleep, their airway is more likely to flop shut and occlude. There are other groups of patients who have a very brisk arousal response, so they're much more likely to arouse from these uh, events, and as we'll see subsequently, the consequences to this brisk arousal, which are sympathetic effects, surges in adrenaline, noradrenaline, so you have swings in blood pressure and swings in heart rate. There's also this issue of loop gain, so people over-respond to changes in chemosensitivity and in oxygen levels, so they react differently to the consequences of the apnea. And then there are other people with floppy muscles. This group uh, with the uh, passive, so airway likely to, to close easily, are those who are obese, or at least a subgroup of those who are obese, a lot of uh, mass around the neck, and that's more likely to make the airway flop, flop shut. But you can see there can be a mixture of reasons why someone is more likely or less likely to develop sleep apnea. The interesting thing, too, is these underlying mechanisms may help predict treatment response. So what's, what's happening and how does this link in with diabetes and, and cardiovascular disease and some of the other aspects you've been talking about today? Well, sleep apnea in its own right will, uh, by fragmenting sleep, will lead to sleep restriction and sleep debt. The sleep fragmentation is, is poor, as, you, as, as you'll see from the sympathetic stress point of view. And then on top of that, there's intermittent uh, hypoxemia. <coughs> Also, sleep restriction in its own right, even in your eye, will affect um, leptin and ghrelin levels, and so there'll be impacts on, on appetite and satiety, uh, links with obesity, and then particularly the hypoxemia and the sleep fragmentation leads to this sort of cascade of problems, as I mentioned, sympathetic stimulation, uh, oxidative stress, and a range of um, other sort of activated uh, factors that will impact on uh, beta cell dysfunction, insulin resistance, sympathetic effects on hypertension, um, and then impact on type 2 diabetes, and microvascular and um, macrovascular disease. And uh, of course, add in the hypoxemia effects on that, which may impact on, say, retinopathy or uh, other diabetic type complications. And so there's a whole range of factors that cascade and add together to exacerbate um, the risk or uh, make worse underlying uh, diabetes or ischemic heart disease. And just to demonstrate that, these are a range of studies that were carried out in healthy subjects, but just looking at the impact of sleep restriction on uh, insulin sensitivity, sleep fragmentation and hypoxia. The fewer hypoxia studies, it's more difficult to do them ethically. But as you'll appreciate, in obstructive sleep apnea, all these events are going on. So even in normals, you have this impact on um, underlying uh, insulin sensitivity. So we, I, I mentioned this bi-directional impact of uh, uh, obstructive sleep or, or co-relationship between uh, diabetes and obstructive sleep apnea. This is looking at new incident type 2 diabetes in cohorts of patients with obstructive sleep apnea. Relative risk here you can see is 1.6. And when it's adjusted for confounders such as obesity and lipids and so on, it comes out at about 1.35. I know you were talking about this this morning, but that's uh, somewhere um, above the uh, relative risk associated with uh, uh, reduced activity during the day and somewhat less than uh, a, fa a family history of, of diabetes. So if you have a structure sleep apnea, you're more likely to develop type 2 diabetes if you don't already have it. And then this is the other way around in the bi-directional relationship. So these are 12 um, studies, about six from the USA, three from Europe and three from Asia, but looking in diabetic, type 2 diabetic cohorts, the uh, prevalence of type 2, uh, of, sorry, of, of obstructive sleep apnea in type 2 patients, the red bars here are the overall level of the obstructive sleep apnea, and then uh, this is mild, moderate, and severe. And the American studies, presumably because they're more obese, slightly more obese, have the higher levels, but these are really high. Um, 
prevalences of obstructive sleep apnea in, in patients with type 2 diabetes. So it's, it's really common in this group. And a more recent study, so this is one that you may well be aware of, it's published earlier this year um, from this health improvement network with data gathered on this large volume of patients from um, nearly 800 practices in the UK. Difficult to read, but basically the only bar that's going across the midline, so this is all increased risk of uh, OSA in patients with type 2 diabetes. This is just the younger subgroup. And the take-home message from that is patients, as you can see there, um, have about a 50% risk of di uh, developing obstructive sleep apnea compared to those without type 2 diabetes. Um, and those who are most likely of all to, as I suppose one might expect, are, are men, those with greater levels of obesity, um, cardiovascular disease and diabetic complications, <coughs> insulin use and, and interestingly depression. So that's where we are in terms of, of prevalence and the, the, the numbers of these patients. Um, Diagnosis, we mostly use uh, what we call uh, respiratory polygraphy, so we don't need to do the complex polysonography studies with monitoring of uh, actual sleep um, in its own right. Um, but these studies give us uh, oximetry and we can break down the events into obstructive events and um, central events, mixed events, and that gives us uh, a, a good um, chance of getting a diagnosis. And the studies done at home are almost equivalent to those being done at hospital, so increasing numbers of patients are having studies done at home. You'd be aware of having patients on, on, on CPAP therapy. I think it has improved as a treatment over time. It's, it's somewhat easier to use now. The NICE guidelines, which was a NICE technology appraisal from 2008, we're working on at the moment on the new guidelines, and that is CPAP is treatment of choice in those with moderate or severe obstructive sleep apnea. So that means they've got symptoms and an apnea hypopnea index of over 15. And it can be used in patients with mild obstructive sleep apnea if other measures such as weight loss um, and other potential treatments, positional management, sleeping on their side, mandibular advancement, splint, and I'll mention that later, have not been effective. Um, CPAP treatment, uh, I mentioned it has improved. I mean, it's still something that the patient has to buy into and use, and there's uh, psychology to introducing CPAP therapy. This is the S8, this is already now the S10 device, and so they get smaller. This one's got an integral humidifier, although I don't think all patients need humidification, but many do. What's also Im improved is the interface over time. Um, but you still have to motivate patients to do this. What is also helpful is, is telemonitoring, and many patients now are telemonitored at home because that means you can understand what's going on with them within the first few days. Because the bottom line is usually, unless they have started using their treatment in the first two or three days, your chances of getting it to work start falling off hugely. So you have to get in there early and just um, asking patients to come back in a few weeks or downloading the data in a few weeks, you haven't really caught them at that critical time and worked with them to make it right, dealt with mass problems, nasal side effects, problems they have with using it. Um, and you can remotely change the pressure and adapt it to them at home. What common question from patients is, do I have to use it every night? How long do I have to use it? Well. One of the reasons it's really important that they use their treatments is for those who are sleepy, it will reduce their sleepiness, and that's particularly important not only for their quality of life and everyday functioning, but also from the point of view of driving and the DVLA. You can't drive with a start to sleep apnea unless your sleepiness is controlled. And the, the evidence is, from most of the studies, is this is the Etworth sleepiness score, so up above 10 <coughs> is abnormal. Uh, and this is actually people, percentage correcting into the normal range. This is the functional outcomes of sleeping in a score. So another questionnaire, multiple sleep latency test. What one really sees, particularly in the Etworth score, is you get improvements up to about four hours on sleepiness, and then after that, you tend to get a kind of plateauing. And that's 
the evidence such as it is behind advising patients they should use it at least four hours at night. In fact, using it more may be much better. And uh, <coughs> this is a study, I'm sorry it's not quite so visible, but essentially this is looking at CPAP adherence or compliance and effects on blood pressure. And although this study too, so this is used less than 3.6 hours, 3.6 hours to 5.65, then more than 5.6 hours at night, the sleepiness was controlled as expected um, at, at this about four hour stage. So their well, sleepiness score was significantly better if they'd used it at this level. But the effect on the blood pressure didn't occur until the, the, they used it for a longer period of time. So it may be that there's not just one dose effect of CPAP, using it for four hours may be helpful for your sleepiness, but you may need to use it for longer periods to have other cardiovascular, and in this example, um, blood pressure impacts. So just, you know, the more the better, especially from a cardiovascular point of view. Just coming back to, for some while we just had these uh, cohort studies looking at outcomes, and this is a cumulative incidence of, this happens to be non-fatal cardiovascular events, but actually there's a similar graph, although fortunately less number for, for fatal cardiovascular events. This is untreated patients with severe obstructive sleep apnea. This is controls, and then you've got people with mild obstructive sleep apnea. But in this, these cohort studies, you can see this is the group of patients with severe obstructive sleep apnea obstructive sleep apnea treated with CPAP and you brought this group down to the blue line here which is nearly well, it's virtually this is virtually the same as the smokers not quite the same as the controls but this is the evidence we had the best evidence we had for a long time to persuade patients to use CPAP not only to control their sleepiness but also to reduce their cardiovascular risk Now, there has been one uh, detailed study, so a randomised controlled study, looking at CPAP for secondary prevention of cardiovascular events. So these are people who already had cardiovascular disease, established events. And they randomised those patients, if they had moderate or severe obstructive sleep apnea, to CPAP or control. But the difficulty we have with these long-term outcome studies is you can't ethically randomise sleepy patients because they can't drive, and you can't ethically randomise patients who desaturate significantly or profoundly at night. So those patients always have to be excluded from the studies. So these are a subgroup of patients um, looking at CPAP and secondary prevention. And in fact, it didn't show, taking the whole group of uh, secondary prevention patients as a whole, CPAP did not reduce the risk of subsequent events apart from a subgroup analysis in patients with cerebrovascular disease, so stroke incidence and TIAs was reduced by CPAP use, but that wasn't their primary outcome measure, it was just a post hoc uh, subsequent analysis. So we have this kind of cohort evidence and then we have randomised controlled trials, but with this important exception that you have to exclude from these trials, quite possibly, the subgroup of patients who are sleepy and more hypoxemic at night who might benefit the most. The next question is obviously what about CPAP treatment um, in obstructive sleep apnea patients who have type 2 diabetes? What impact does the CPAP treatment not only have on the obstructive sleep apnea but also the type 2 diabetes? And the additional, as this one is relatively negative, but some of the earlier studies, relatively short-term studies, case control studies, or shorter randomised studies, suggested some, some sort of benefit on, on measures of um, uh, diabetic control. But subsequent, tending to be bigger studies, a uh, whole host of them, over, with, with more patients included over longer periods of time, have not shown very impressive benefit of CPAP. This is on the diabetic control. I right? set aside any impacts on, on sleepiness or other features. One interestingly retracted. Uh, and then one study showing some sort of benefit. But again, I think we have uh, some particular issues to consider. So again, uh, on average in, in these studies, there are people using the CPAP 
not for hugely long periods at night, um, and so the average use um, is relatively low. Uh, in some of the studies, 3.9, 3.6 hours, some, sometimes a bit, a bit higher, so compliance may be variable in the studies. And again, you have to exclude the patients who are, are very, very sleepy because they can't be randomised uh, ethically. So I'll, I'll move on to sleep and obstructive sleep apnea in type 1 diabetes. Um, in fact, obstructive sleep apnea is, is uh, commoner than the uh, usual population in type 1 diabetes. And here, obesity is not a confounder. There's no relationship with obesity. And this may be that the obstructive sleep apnea is related to some of the effects of underlying neuropathy. So on the um, innovation of the pharyngeal muscles, Autonomic control may be affected too, and that may influence the uh, response to the apnea. And it does seem, though, that uh, in patients with type 1 diabetes who also have obstructive sleep apnea, there are higher rates, you can see here, of peripheral neuropathy and autonomic neuropathy compared to those without. And so probably particularly important to treat. Uh, another factor, harking back to the slide I showed you earlier, that this is in type 1 diabetic patients, but those who have a shorter sleep time, so less than 6.5 hours, compared to a sleep time of more than 6.5 hours, actually had worse levels of HbA1c. So just improving sleep opportunity and sleep time might actually help diabetic control. I mentioned earlier the uh, gender effects and obstructive sleep apnea, and there are, are key differences which I think are important. Um, we discussed the sort of uh, presentation, but females are, are slightly more likely to present not just with sleepiness, but with, uh, as I mentioned, insomnia, uh, maybe with primary mood disturbances, uh, sleep disturbance, fatigue, and more likely to use terms like fatigue and tiredness during the day as opposed to sleepiness. And for the same levels of those uh, underlying sleepiness or fatigue, it seems to be a greater uh, impact on their quality of life scores um, and impacts on, uh, as you can see, uh, sick leave and work performance and tending to report less snoring. Um, we talked about pregnancy earlier. Um, one would expect snoring to increase as pregnancy progresses. Uh, some of this is related to edema of the upper airway, especially in the third trimester. Um, but obstructive sleep apnea in a pregnant patients, even if they've got uh, type 2 diabetes or not, is associated with worse fetal outcome. And in that group of patients, you may be more likely to see hypopneas rather than avert apneas. And so you need to be, have quite discriminating diagnostic equipment to pick that up and, and have a relatively low threshold to treat. Um, obstructive sleep apnea in pregnancy. The prevalence of obstructive sleep apnea in females increases considerably after the menopause, so that has to be some kind of hormonal impact, a relatively greater impact of um, testosterone levels. And so uh, the presentation, though, may be uh, with tiredness, depression, fatigue and sleep disturbance as part of that whole constellation of symptoms. I appreciate that these are very general presenting symptoms that makes it difficult, but at least should be part of a kind of consideration of differential diagnosis. And when you do sleep studies in females, you may see a, a lower AHI, um, shorter apnea episodes, it may be related to different levels of chemosensitivity, um, and interestingly, a higher frequency of REM-related obstructive sleep apnea. And there is some evidence that obstructive sleep apnea in REM sleep is more toxic from a cardiovascular point of view, has a more severe impact than occurring in non-REM sleep. But both you don't want fragmented. And some other interesting information as well. So greater levels of inflammation for, as I mentioned, this oxidative stress and inflammatory pathway for a given level of AHI uh, and different sorts of uh, pharyngeal uh, collapsibility, partly uh, anatomical. So when taking a history, um, this is the sort of, most patients will snore, but of course you don't know if you snore if you haven't got a partner, and you might not have a partner because you snore very badly. 
um, witness that near is pretty common, but not, not all partners actually notice that in the individual, but these are good questions to ask about. Nocturnal choking can be uh, a, a problematic. Also nocturia, so we see an increasing group of patients coming from the urologists or even, uh, females too, uh, in whom they've been investigated for urinary tract infections, prostatism and so on. All of that has been sorted out, but they're still having nocturia three or four times a night. And that is an association with obstructive sleep apnea. Basically, urine production continues at the same rate as it does during the day because of this higher level of sleep fragmentation um, from, from the obstructive sleep apnea. And then as I try to stress, we're not only talking about sleepiness, but we're talking about fatigue, tiredness, different semantics used depending on the individual, and then concentration, lapses, vigilance during the day. Um, we are also seeing patients referred now from memory clinics with cognitive impairment, especially if you fragment your REM sleep, you're probably fragmenting your memory processing for the day and sorting out short and long-term memory. Um, road traffic accidents, 20% um, of road traffic accidents are caused by people falling asleep at the wheel. Not all of those are patients with obstructive sleep apnea, but unfortunately they tend to be more fatal, lethal accidents because if you're just a bad driver or you're speeding, you will make some attempts to steer out of an oncoming car, but if you fall asleep at the wheel, you will just plow on. Um, interestingly, too, subtle personality changes, often short-tempered, um, and other family members can just notice that the person is, is just, um, just re overreacting to situations. Mood disturbance, um, effects on individual sex life, and sleep is such a powerful determinant in many of the uh, quality of life tools of, of quality of life. So if sleep is disrupted, it's very likely you have big impacts on quality of life. So I just come on to um, where we were with the previous NICE guidelines. So there was this NICE clinical knowledge summary um, from four years ago, and then some sign guidelines from ages ago, um, and then we, we will move on to the new NICE guidelines. But this is where we were, I think, to the more recent information. So those who need to be urgently referred are, are those with obvious occupational risks, uh, driving risk, comorbidities that are going to be made much worse by obstructive sleep apnea. But this, this guidance here didn't include uh, diabetic patients. Um, and, and as I said, those with other conditions where the hypoxemia is likely to be exacerbated. And then for a more routine referral, this was what was suggested, um, that you take as a cutoff uh, an Etworth sleepiness score of above 10. And I know many CCGs set that up as referral, uh, as a referral criterion. Um, the, I, I think the problem about that now is that we cannot have that in the new guidelines because we will miss that whole group of patients with more diffuse symptoms of sleep disturbance. There are particular subgroups too, so um, in the uh, cardiology guidelines, the ESC and the American cardiology guidelines, refractory hypertension um, is an indication for considering obstructive sleep apnea and doing a sleep study, because it's, uh, uh, if you treat the obstructive sleep apnea, you may eat more, much more easily control the hypertension. Also, recurrent atrial flutter or fibrillation, people having recurrent DC conversion, if they're flipping back into their atrial flutter or fibrillation, they are much more likely to do that if they've got underlying obstructive sleep apnea. So that's another group to consider a sleep study for. And other obvious groups, nocturnal angina, nocturnal epilepsy. And I put here as a query, poor glycemic control. In terms of treatment, I'm coming towards the end now. So the evidence about weight reduction, and this is on the obstructive sleep apnea itself. Um, and what impacts you can get on the HbA1c uh, level. Uh, so this sort of weight loss did impact on the, uh, both the apnea hypopnea index and uh, the diabetic control. And studies here on gastric banding, or here's a meta-analysis of bariatric surgery. In essence, what it's showing is even with significant weight loss, you get a reduction in AHI. This one, too, big, big meta-analysis, so a significant decrease in AHI. So here, for the pooled group, uh, baseline AHI 55, 
and then after the surgery down to 16. But you're not always curing patients. So even with significant weight loss, you may take them down from moderate or severe to mild obstructive sleep apnea, but you may not necessarily remove the obstructive sleep apnea. They may be able to come off CPAP and go on to other treatments. And I've just listed the other treatments here. So snoring and mild obstructive sleep apnea, these are the straightforward and obvious things to do. There are some position modifiers that are being um, evaluated at the moment that just buzz and, and to, to get people to flip over onto their side. The treatment of rhinitis, obvious ENT interventions, tonsils, adenoids dealt with if they're significant factor, but they're not usually factors in middle-aged patients, um, but maybe in younger patients and in children. Mandibular advancement splint, usually the semi-customized ones can be effective in mild obstructive sleep apnea. They are used in moderate obstructive sleep apnea. They're sometimes effective, but can also be used in those with moderate or severe obstructive sleep apnea who do not tolerate CPAP well, but they may not be as effective. They may be better than nothing. And then uh, with severe obstructive sleep apnea, CPAP is the treatment of choice. No evidence that oxygen is effective. You may correct the uh, hypoxemic dips, but you won't impact on the sleep fragmentation or the um, sleepiness levels during the day. For obesity hypoventilation, so these are individuals with obstructive sleep apnea and they're underventilating at night as well, as indicated by a raised CO2 level, then non-invasive ventilation is the treatment of choice. In terms of education, um, this was a quality improvement study from the US that showed that whereas there, the providers did understand the links, or, or a reasonable proportion of them, the links between obstructive sleep apnea and how could, that could affect on glycemic control, very few of the patients knew about uh, obstructive sleep apnea um, if they had uh, type 2 diabetes. So my pragmatic take-homes are Look for sleepy patients, but on top of that, also think about patients with other additional sleep-related symptoms. You may be able to get corroboration from the partner, um, and some patients uh, have bring along videos with them which almost make the diagnosis themselves. There's a particular um, issue with obstructive sleep apnea on driving over and above their type 2 diabetes. And I hope I've highlighted to you there are some gender differences which are important. Weight loss and bariatric surgery do work, but you may not necessarily uh, cure them of their obstructive sleep apnea. And CPAP is effective treatment in, in moderate and severe obstructive sleep apnea. In some mild patients, it's more likely to work if they're sleepy. But a study that's appeared on, online in Lancet Respiratory Medicine only today, looking at CPAP in mild obstructive sleep apnea, also shows benefit on the sleepiness and insomnia, even in the mild group. That's all. Thank you very much. Thank you.